Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction, but more importantly, it's about recovery, and it's brought to you by our friends at KnowYourScript.org. KnowYourScript.org is just a wealth of information if you want to talk to yourself, your doctor, or loved ones about opioids. Uh, we're not a against opioids on this podcast because opioids serve a purpose. We are just against the abuse of them, and a lot of people get into opioids through a legal prescription. Oh, definitely. Um yeah, we're against the abuse of them, and we're against the lack of education about them, yes. I think, right? Because once people understand what they're taking, uh, they learn how to ask the right questions, ask for alternatives. Uh, if you've had a problem with them in the past, know how to talk about the fact that you're in recovery and are there other alternatives, those sorts of things. That's what we're for. Yeah, we're right? for the advocacy of your own health, and yeah. you mm-hmm. need to know which questions to ask. A long time ago, somebody, when I was first getting into healthcare, mm-hmm. said to me, you need to help people learn to be good consumers of their own health care. And I remember thinking, yeah, I don't know, that's not my responsibility. And that that was what I thought. But yeah. now I realize it absolutely is my responsibility as a health care provider, and I and I uh, think it's amazing how many people in recovery take that job on themselves as well. Uh, almost every guest we've ever had in here uh, is a great advocate for helping other people be better consumers of their health care and ask the right questions. So I, I love it. Well, that's why this podcast was created to lessen the stigma about addiction. I have always said is once you got into the fraternity of addiction, by meaning that you have an addict addiction, uh, you know, then people start sharing wisdom. But we're not sharing it for people outside of the fraternity. And that's why I wanted this podcast to be is to let everybody know that there's a good chance. And I'm going to say almost 100 percent chance that. That someone in your lifetime is going to be addicted to something. And this information is, For just, sure. is just going to be beneficial to help you better understand, to be more empathetic, to help you set boundaries, to help you navigate this murky water that we call addiction. Because it really is, and it takes on so many different forms. The crazy thing is, and I just was in another meeting this morning, and I was talking to this beautiful young lady about addiction. And her, her husband or ex-husband was an addict, and uh, you know she thought I was going to just jump on her side. And I go... Well, you got to understand, um, he's going through some stuff too. I understand you are, but what most people don't realize is that addiction is a family disease. Yep, affects everybody. And and most of the love and support get uh, put on the addict himself. But what about the daughters, the sons, the parents, the neighbors, the in-laws? You know, I mean, that's one thing that I, in my addiction that I still need to do is sit down with my ex-in-laws and tell them sorry. Because I put you guys through a lot of stuff. I mean, my father-in-law, my ex-father-in-law, picked me up for one of my DUIs. Oh, did he really? You know what I mean? And I didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. But, boy, I was sure grateful that he did. You know. And, well, so what's stopping you from going and talking to him? It just popped into my head. And, and, and uh, I mean, there's a long list of people that I yeah. need to thank for my recovery and the ability to do what I do. Uh, uh, the world is a forgiving place, but you've got to do the work. And I didn't. Uh, you got to do the work even when you don't get the forgiveness. You know, we can't expect everybody who we've wronged to be on our timetable, right? But it, I think we have to do the right thing and reach out. It's interesting because I do have some friends. <laughs> That don't want to be friends with me anymore. It's not because they're not happy for my success and that I'm sober. That they just go, I just don't need this in my life. Yeah, okay. And, and I don't blame them. And I don't blame them. Well, but how's I mean, that, how's that make you feel? I mean, it hurts. It, it it does. You understand it, but it hurts, right? Yeah. But what people don't understand about boundaries are boundaries are for you and for them to protect yourself. And to protect them. And so, you know, those are boundaries that they chose. And so what kind of guy would I be to barge past their boundaries? Selfish. Yeah. And I don't want to be selfish. And in my addiction, I was extremely selfish. So all I can do is respect their boundaries. Sure. You know, and yeah, I mean. And you never know how the story ends. You don't. So right now they may not be comfortable being friends with you. Mm -hmm. And that may be a permanent boundary. Or sometimes boundaries go away after they've served their purpose. Or we, we don't know. They might end up going through something similar than I did, and they'll want to reach out and wonder how I did it, and if sure. maybe I can be a help. So that's the thing. Is that no, and and I, that's the thing about re- boundaries is you just need to respect them. You don't have to like them, and you don't necessarily have to agree with them. 
Sure. You just have to respect them. Yeah, if you respect the person, you respect the boundaries they set. And, you know, when a person is thick in their active addiction, uh, they they hurt a lot of people and they stress a lot of people out. And so um, that's another impressive thing for me, talking with people like yourself and others who are in recovery, is a, a total shift in attitude uh, about, you know, understanding how they've affected other people and, and being more respectful. I think some of the most respectful people of others are people in recovery because they've been on both sides. They've violated the trust and, and boundaries of, of close friends and family. Now they're on the other side trying to repair uh, relationships and get themselves into a better place. And I, I love that respect that comes with that of other people. In the 90s, there was this punk band and it was called the Me First and the Gimme Gimmies. Yeah. Oh, I think I saw them here in Salt Lake once. But that was my addiction. Me first and the gimme <laughs> yeah. And that's all I was worried about. I mean, I, I, I tried to do the best I could to spread the love and give people what they needed. But at the end of the day, it was just about getting what I wanted. And I would manipulate the situation. I would create arguments. I would create situations where I knew the result was me getting what I needed and what I wanted. And you being a fun, happy, smiley, outgoing person – I think that made it a little easier to get it did. your needs met. You know, you know and, and, but, but looking back in hindsight, yeah. uh, which I've been doing a lot lately, and we'll get into that in just a second, is that I was very selfish. And I never thought I was a selfish person because I was still able to give most people what they wanted or what they needed. But the reality was it was only when I wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. And I could spread the love and make everybody feel like that. But the reality was I was working for what I wanted and what I needed. Yeah. Well, so when I say that I've been talking about that in hindsight, um, me and my kids got this opportunity. And coming up in two weeks, we're going on this reality TV show. I've heard a little bit about it. Yeah, it's we, exciting. We can't mention the name of the TV show or what it really is about, but basically... Well, not yet. Not yet. And when it's all said and done, I'll tell you when the viewing party is. Because I think people are going to want to see you and your cute kids on the show. So it's me and my three kids battling another family mm-hmm. over a, a journey and how we interact with each other, how we come together, how we solve problems. And it's not even going to be here in the United States. You have to travel. Yep. And so we've been doing a lot of talking with producers and all this stuff and and, and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's going on. And uh, yesterday, me and my daughter were doing some filming. And it was interesting to see and hear her story again. Uh, of what she went through. Because once again, a lot of attention is, is is thrust upon me because of the podcast and what I do for the community I'm out and about. But even my ex-wife gets questions about me daily. How much fun is that for her? You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the guy that she left because I was an alcoholic and she didn't want anything to do with me. She's probably like, I tried to divorce this guy and I can't stop talking about it. And, and people ask about me. I mean, and, and she's gracious and, and she's really she's super nice. And yeah. she's really good about it. You know what I mean? But my personality sometimes dominates the conversation or the the lay of the land. Yeah. And so it was it was very insightful for me once again to sit back and listen to my daughter yeah. and talk about what she went through and you know, so th- this one question is, you know, they asked her, you know, why we're doing this and what's this all about? And she said, I want to do this because I want to create new memories to replace the bad memories. Wow, that's interesting. You know, and, and it, it's, it's very it's, honest. It, it, 100% honest. And it blew me away because there's nothing we can do about the past. And we can't just live in there and we can't dwell upon it. And you, you can't spend much time there. But they are memories that she has. Yeah, and she must think of them often enough that her thought about what you, she wants to accomplish now is to replace those. So they're still on her mind with some regularity, I guess. And I and I said to her, I said, so, but, I mean, all our vacations weren't that bad. And she goes, Dad, were you with us? Because they weren't <laughs> really good. Oh, man. And, and, and it breaks my heart because a lot of times when we'd go on vacations – and this is where the selfish part of me came in, is that I'm on vacation. And as adults, you know that when you go on vacations, there's almost two different vacations. And I now understand why my parents always did two vacations. They did a family vacation, and then they did a grown-ups vacation. Right. 
Because the family vacation, you're working if you're the dad or the mom. Yeah. Right? You, you, yeah. I mean, because you're, you're wrangling you're kids. You're on call 24-7. You're, you're wrangling <laughs> kids. You're checking everybody into hotel rooms. You're making sure everybody's got ski passes or everybody's got this. Everybody's got their underwear. Oh, somebody forgot their toothbrush. They're running the store. You're doing all that. It's not much of a vacation as a parent Yeah, if you're going to do something big. Right. So when you know we do that as a family, we'd come back, and then my mom and dad was like, now we're going to go on vacation. Mm-hmm. We're gonna go do what we want to do, and that's grown up stuff. And we're gonna lay by the pool, relax, yeah. and relax. You know, because there's not much of that. And so it made me think that you know, I thought we were doing some cool vacations, but there was always fighting involved, and it wasn't great. Did you resist trying to? Did you just want to lay by the pool and relax? Was that is that what you mean by selfish? No, I just whatever we were doing, I was doing partying. Okay. I was still going, but I wasn't. I you're, wasn't present. You were drinking. I was drinking. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't present. You know what I mean? And it's like, so that put a lot of pressure on your ex-wife that she was checking everybody in and she was doing the details, maybe. Yeah, and I thought I was helping, but I, I was just another kid for her to, to wrangle. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And so that was the selfish part of me, and that's what you know. I'm excited about this opportunity that me and my kids are about to embark on. Is that I want them to know that they can count on me. Yeah. And that I will be there and we will figure this out. That you'll be present. That I'll be present. Yeah. And that's probably one of the biggest blessings that I've received from recovery is the ability to be present. And I think a lot of us take that for granted. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, you know, because we're always future tripping or we're trying to figure out what our next move is rather than just sitting back and enjoying what we have. Because in recovery, they tell you, you can go back and change the past and you can't predict the future. All you have right now is what's in front of you. And that's the only thing that you can control is what you're doing right now. Yep. And that's a valuable lesson. And I don't think many people learn it until it's too late. Well, uh, you know, it's a mindful way of looking at life. Um, I think that it's one of the things we talk about in a lot of therapy sessions uh, with a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. Because if you're not in the present, you can't learn from the past. You can't plan for the future. The only time we ever affect our, our life, our relationships, whatever it is we're doing is in the present. And that doesn't mean you can ignore everything else. No. But you take... You take from the future, you take from the past, but you you do with it in the present. And I think that kids kids have a funny radar about that. Like we often think when we're when we're checking off all the the things on the list for the vacation, or even if it's just after school or a regular weekend, we're getting everything done. The kids can they they live on an emotional level more, and they feel the difference, right? Oh, yeah. And they don't always know how to describe it. You know, now that Presley's older, she can talk about it with a little bit more clarity. But the reality is they feel when parents aren't emotionally present. And what takes us out of the present? Well, stress, anxiety, and depression, those things take us out of the present. But definitely so does uh, substance abuse, right? If you're, if you're high, if you're drunk, even if you're just kind of buzzed, if that you're not present focused. And we only get so many years with those little people in your life in that way. And then they become in their 20s, they keep hanging on, you wish they'd go away. But when they're little, you only get so much time with them. And, and it's important to try to be as present as you can. So I'm, I'm really glad that you get to have this opportunity. It's, it's a fun kind of yeah. exciting game to play. But, but more than that, they get to have focused time with their dad for, for all those days. Now, there is a winner and a loser on this uh, TV show. And I sat my kids down when we agreed to do it. I said, I don't care about winning. It would be nice to win, but I don't care about it. What I care about is that we do it and we do it together and to the best of our ability. And if we do that, we will have a story for the rest of our life. We will have a connection for the rest of our lives that we can share. So I just want us to go out there and give it our all and give it our best. Good. And that's all that's all I care about. I think that's the right message to send to them. But I'm gonna say to you Yeah. Don't come home if you lose. Okay. Okay. No, that's, 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 that's that between me sense. and you. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, you're I getting it. the real talk. No pressure. And it's like I don't want to see you here 
if you don't win. Before we introduce you to our guest today, who's <laughs> only been sober for about a month. Right. Uh, I which know. is, I mean, this is this is I am raw. excited yeah. to have him on the show today. Because a lot of times we have people that are veterans in the recovery world where they've got three, five, seven, twelve. We've had some people. You're, have, you're getting the, yeah, into that category. Three and yourself. a half. Yeah. And 20 years. But what about the person who's just been sober a month? We're going to hear about that. But before we do that, I want to leave you with this last thing, is that a lot of times people think about life as a beginning and an end. And there is a beginning and there's an end, but real life happens in between. It's the journey. And that's what it being present is all about, mm-hmm. is learning as we go. And we're always evolving. We're always moving. Uh, just do that. You know what I mean? If you can look at it that way. But so many times we do, we get focused on the, the beginning and the end. But so, all the good stuff happens in between. So can I add a, a Buddhist saying yes. to that? Every Is that mo- the guy in Fox 13? Uh, that's Big Buddha. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're related. Um, a Buddhist saying, which I really, really like, which helps you stay present focused and is very optimistic. It's very simple. Every moment is a chance to start again. Mm. And so if in the last moment you felt like you weren't your best self, you weren't your best parent, you weren't your best spouse, uh, you, you have another moment coming up where you can try again. You can start again, and you can become present, focused. If yesterday was a tough day for you, if this morning didn't work out, you have this next moment that's right in front of you to turn it around. And I, I, I use that in my own life sometimes. I really like that saying. Give it to me one more time. Uh, every moment is a chance to start again. I love it. I think we should title this episode that. Okay. Coming up, we're going to talk to Robert Woolsey, who's been sober now just about a month. We're going to find out why he wanted to do this podcast right here on Project Recovery. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. Our guest today is Robert Woolsey. He's been sober now officially 28 days. 28 days. There's a movie about that. Yeah, it was Sandra Bullock. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Actually, when it comes to recovery movies... That is a pretty decent movie. I mean, it's a little campy and there's some love in there. But if you strip it down, the principles that they teach in that movie are pretty realistic. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's a pretty realistic look into the life of an alcoholic. Yep. Um, Robert, you reached out to me a couple weeks ago. uh, So you must have been just sober two weeks. Right. What made you want to do this podcast? Because for the most people. They want to get some time behind them because there's some pressure of coming out and telling people that you're sober and the other people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. They don't know if this is really going to happen, if this one's going to take. So, I mean, th- there is a little bit of pressure in you coming out and doing this so early into your recovery. Absolutely. You know, I I believe that because I've battled this, this disease for a long time, I, I went into recovery my first time at 26, not because I wanted to, it's because I didn't want to lose my family at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been kind of in and out that, those revolving doors. But the one thing that I've come to realize that as far as recovery goes is that it literally is a daily reprieve contingent upon my spiritual fitness. I haven't had a spiritual fitness. I haven't had that connection. And I'm just realizing that I've been missing that. In my little stints of having some time under my belt, mm-hmm. that was the one piece. That, that, that was the, mis- the missing uh, piece of the puzzle for me. Okay. So it's finally – dawning on me that I have to have that power. Whatever he may be, it may be, it's it's nature for me. It's the mountains, it's riding my bike, it's up skiing, dirt biking with my boys, that kind of stuff. You know, and we've we found that uh, a, a running theme here on the podcast. The opposite of addiction is an abstinence. It's connection. And you found your connection this time around. Yep. Well, let's get to the beginning. Uh, where does the story of Robert Woolsey begin? So I had... Um, my mom, basically, I was raised by a single mom. She raised four of us. Uh, we were pretty poor. Didn't have a whole lot. All boys, all girls? Uh, so I've got an older brother and an older sister and a younger brother. Mm-hmm. The baby is, I want to say, 40. Um, and how old are you now? I, I'll, I'll be 52 before I know it. Coming up. It's coming up, yeah. Um, but yeah, so she she raised four of us, and I she did a wonderful job. The, the reality is, and, I, and when I look back, and you know, it's funny because as as an alcoholic and an addict, um, and having these um, these addictions, I've always reflected why why me. I mean, I didn't have a, I I didn't have an abusive family, 
you know, I didn't have an abusive dad or a abusive mom. You know, I, I've sat in enough rooms to hear some stories and think, what? Why me? So you're saying you didn't have what you consider to be real trauma? Yeah. I had a great childhood, you know. I mean, my mom did a really good job, but the reality is she was never around. So I was a free bird when it came to making choices and, and hanging out with the wrong people. You know, I did a lot of that uh, growing up. I think that free range childhood is great in a lot of ways. And I think nowadays there should be a little bit more of that allowed to kids. But uh, when you have a lot of free range time, when you have a single parent who's you know, doing her very best to, to put food on the table and everything. She can't be around as much. And so your own personality sort of becomes a big factor. Trauma wasn't a big factor, but your own personality. So let me ask you, as a kid, were you kind of a curious, impulsive, want to check out, you know, energetic kind of kid? Or were you a bookworm, kind of stay home kind of kid? <laughs> I was very, very compulsive and very energetic. Like my mom uh, was always worrying about me, jumping off the roof. I, I had an adrenaline junkie kind of thing, yep. always getting hurt because I was doing stupid things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you another question because I, I see a little of you and me. Uh, when you were young and you were running around and really no parental supervision, were you hanging out with older kids or were you mostly kids your age? Mostly kids my, my age. There was a couple that were older. Uh-huh. But it was mainly my age, kids. And was your role always to try to impress the group you're around or do the crazy things that nobody else would do? Exactly. All the time. Well, you met a kindred spirit yeah. there, Casey. I, I was the kid that was there like, did you just see what Woolsey did? You know, by jumping off the roof and doing backflips off cliffs and just whatever. And that becomes your first addiction. That's my first addiction. I, and I, the same with me. It was like, you can't do that. Yeah, I can't watch. Yep. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And then it was the stories that people told that I was addicted to. I was and like, that actually does bring a, a neurochemical high that's natural. But the act of doing the backflip and then the ooh and ah for, and praise from all your friends and then knowing people are talking about you, that's all like neurochemical feel goods going on. And so you, you're right. Absolutely. That can become a person's first addiction. So you're running around, you're doing backflips off of buildings and jumping off cliffs. When do you first try alcohol or drugs? I was, I believe my first drink was with a friend in eighth grade. We stole a couple beers out of his dad's fridge and went off to the side of the house, drank them, and then went and rode our bikes. And I just remember that feeling I got. like, Because I was kind of a little bit of a shy kid until you got to know me. Then I was that uh, class clown. I was always the kind of the goofy guy. You know, I love to make people laugh kind of. But um, the feeling that I got that day was was a good feeling. And then it just ended up, you know, the next thing was – uh, pot and then through high school it was it was trying mushrooms and LSD and cocaine I mean it, it was all through high school that I tried all that stuff so you got into those what we'd call heavier drugs pretty quickly mm-hmm. and I, I, I like that you point out like even though you were a class clown and, and you like to do fun daring things a part of you was shy yeah and, I still am kind of to a point yeah and and it, a lot of people because you don't see that on a person's outside all the time. Like you can model shyness. We can all act shy and somebody could identify we're acting shy. But shyness, that anxiety, that hesitation, that social discomfort, that's a real internal thing. And a lot of times kids who become the class clown are actually compensating for those feelings of shyness as well as the alcohol and drugs. Like we've had – how many people have we had on the show, Casey, who, who they said, oh, man – when I when I took that first hit or when I had that first drink, that that little shyness, that anxiety, poof, it was gone. I just love that euphoric release. It's like getting out of prison. They say I became the person I always wanted yeah. to be. Yeah, and you don't have that that feeling anymore. Exactly. It was like this is this is this is what I'm missing. This is who I'm supposed to be. Yep. Everybody loves this guy. Hey, this yep. guy is the life of the party. He's not afraid. Yep. He, he's daring. He's bold. He's brazen. He's jumping off roofs. He's doing backflips off of cliffs. Yep. That's this guy. That's the guy I want to be. Yep. And my kids loved it. I mean, I, I always had a good relationship with my kids, even though it was strained and I wasn't present because I was always drinking or using, but they loved what we did. 
because we were always doing that kind of stuff, like going to Lake Powell, and and they were the ones that adventurous. I want to do what Dad's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were you were that adventurous guy, even as an adult with children. I yep. guess. Yeah. So you you partied pretty heavily in high school. It sounds like. Yes, I did. And uh, did how that- did that play out with your friend group? Like, just out of curiosity, like were they trying to keep up with you, or were you kind of doing that solo? What did that look like in high school? You know, the crazy thing is, is, is they were kind of trying to keep up with me to a point. I, ne- I never became um, addicted to, to anything through high school because it was just – it was it was never uh, – so, at some points I would smoke pot. I would, I would buy a baggie and then I would smoke it for you know a week and then I would leave it alone for a while or I would only drink every other weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, so it wasn't – I never became addicted to anything until um, I hurt my back. And they put me on tramadol. This was back when tramadol came out, and mm. it was a non-narcotic and non-addictive, and and that was the start of my addiction. That's what they considered <laughs> I, it, right? Yeah, I yeah. laugh because he goes, "I got addicted to tramadol." That's when tramadol came out, and it was non 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 narcotic <laughs> and not addictive. And I was like, "Well, no, you just that, that's called advertising. <laughs> yeah. That's not yeah. reality." Yeah. But it's interesting right. that you bring up that in high school that you didn't feel addicted because. A lot of times, I think we're guilty of it on this show, too. We just talk about addiction. But the reality is there's use, there's abuse, there's dependency, and then addiction. And so a lot of times people look back and they're like, well, I didn't become an addict until. But it's like, but you were headed down that path. If you, you know, you got to be honest with yourself. If you're using every weekend, you know, then you start abusing when you're like binge drinking because no teenager doesn't binge drink, right? And then and then you're de- you become dependent on it for fun. Well, if we're gonna have fun, we gotta have a six pack or we gotta have you know. And and then eventually, the, for some people, that addiction comes faster. For some people, it's way down the road. But you're not out of the woods if you're in use, abuse, and and dependency. Uh, dependency. Those are those are pretty dangerous places to be. And and so it's important, I think, for us. When we conceptualize substances, the, the, not everybody's in, in addiction, but that doesn't mean they're okay. Right, right. And, you know, you, when you say that, I've reflected back all the way back to high school and in those times. And and the reality is, is when I was asked, like if I had a huge test or something going on and someone came up, hey, we're going to we're going to go on a little hike and go get high. It wasn't even a second thought of okay no problem let's chemistry, go chemistry you're yeah, doing your own like chemistry. i was gone you weren't studying for i chemistry. wasn't studying so yeah there's a lot of different things that led up to where you know sure when i really took it to that next level when it was completely i was 100 percent unmanageable my life was absolutely unmanageable so in high school you said it seemed like most of your friends were trying to keep up with you uh, at any point, did you ever get in any trouble? Did your mom ever say, hey, you know, you might be taking this a little too far? Or was it just kind of you flew under the radar? I, I flew under the radar for the most part. There was a time, and it was I think in my high school years, where I had a brother that went on a mission. And when he came home, it was his first week or two home. And he, I, I just remember waking up face down in the, the backyard in dirt Wow. And my grandpa and him were were trimming the bushes and doing all that stuff. And and my brother, came, my brother came over to me and he he said, "Was it worth it?" That's all he said. My grandpa didn't say anything to me. I just got up and went in the house and was feeling like, you know, yeah, not I get too you. good. Well, that's interesting because for, for the listeners, you, your brother went on a LDS mission, uh-huh. Church of Jesus Christ. And as people who know return missionaries, they tend to be still in that preachy mode when they come home from their mission. So it's interesting he didn't really lay into you, but he did. That's a pretty pointed question. What did yeah. you contemplate it or did you just be like, ah, I, I did. And so so after he said that, because I was going down that road, right? I had friends going down that road. And um and so after he said that, it was within probably a month. I'm like, you know, I I got to change because I'm I'm not. This is not good. So I planted a little I planted seed. Planted a seed. And I yeah. ended up going on a mission. I'm oh, like, you know you? what? Maybe this will be good for me. I didn't go for the right reasons. I didn't go for the right reasons. I went because my brother went, and I went because I thought maybe this is the best route for me to to clean myself up. Kind of. But yeah. the whole time on my mission, I. You're partying. I, I just didn't feel like I should be there. I didn't No, I get that. Like um I um I had some back pain and they I went to the doctor, they gave me the pain pills, you know, and and again, it wasn't taking them till taking them as prescribed. 
Is it was take them till they're gone, and then being bummed out they were gone. While you were on while your mission. While I was on my mission. Yeah, and so... And then wanting more. Yeah. But not being able to get it. So how did you hurt your back? Skiing. And over... I uh, went over the handlebars on my dirt bike at the dunes. And so that, that's when they prescribed you... The tramadol. And... But that was after I got home. Oh, okay. Because I still was having all this pain. And they, and they went, and they took... Uh, an MRI at the time, and they had I've got two bulging discs in my lower lumbar, so they said, we're going to put you on this. And and again, I had never been like physically addicted to anything to where I was dependent on it, and that's when my road to addiction started, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, But it was always there. It sure. was really always there. <laughs> so well, it was keep, building. To keep everybody on the same page, so uh, you get back from your mission, you go see a doctor, they put you on trauma at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you do what uh, most LDS men do when they get home from their mission? Did you get married? I got married. Pretty quick? It was not as quick as most of my friends, but I, I got married like I were uh, within probably four years or so. Now, were you uh, on the trauma doll before no. you got married or after you got after. married? After. It was like within the first year. So within the first several years of my marriage, like my boys were two maybe or three. Are they twins? I got identical boys, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I got a daughter that'll be 20. So I really related to your daughter. Yeah, the latter. time because she's – we've had some really good talks. Um, yeah. So let's get back. You're married now. You're physically dependent upon trauma at all. Yep. And uh, – you said at the age of 26 was your first stint into rehab? Into rehab. And was that because your wife? Yep. And walk me through that. So um, it, it got to the point where I was running out of my prescription before you know, I was to get a refill. And I was just starting to get really irritable and ornery. I'd wake up in withdrawals and be really not the best husband at all to her. Um. And it, I was taking other people's medication. You know, we'd go to friend's house. It all just kind of unraveled. And then that's when I'm like, I need help. So you were, you were sneaking them. You I were, was sneaking you were, them. You'd yeah. go to the bathroom and go through the cabinet, yep. that kind of thing. And I would take take medication. Mm. Yep. And I would imagine at that point you kind of had that, you know, uh, seeking uh, mentality. Like it's always on the forefront of your mind. Like – where am I going to get some? Where are we going? You might even have been willing to go to people's houses to hang out who you didn't like just in case maybe they had something. Is that kind of where you're at Absolutely. mentally at that point? Absolutely. When that, you know, I, I, there, there's a point in the, in the NA book that the doctor's opinion that makes a hundred percent sense to me about the phenom- phenomenon of craving. Cause it, it, as soon as you take, as soon as I take one drink, or one drug, it's on. The compulsiveness and the obsessive desire to have switch. more. And it doesn't – I can't turn it off. Like it's – I want – you know. Well, that's why they say one is too many and a thousand is never it's, enough. Exactly. Um, you know, it's – it's it, yeah. you know, when, when, that's the choice I have every day. The, I, the one choice with my alcoholism is do I choose to pick up that drink? And as of today, 100 percent of the time, I've said no. But uh, there always is that choice now. You know, when people go back and forth, is uh, is it a, you know, is it a disease or is it a choice? Well, no, the disease is inside me. My choice is: do I pick it up or do I not? Right. That's that's the choice. Yeah, and that, even your story of uh, the cold medicine. Yeah, you know, like you know, chances of that be you know so small, not very much, but there was alcohol in it. I had a fifteen minute conversation in front of a. a cold bottle uh, for cold remedies and it had NyQuil and it had liquor in it and I thought maybe I should and then my mind goes no because even if I do that opens up a window that right. opens up a window and a thought that maybe I could handle it this time and the reality is I know that I can't so I don't even put myself in that so I just went to bed yeah no I I, I agree anything anything that has any kind of mind altering substance mm-hmm it's just best to stay away from. So you go into rehab. What kind of rehab do you go into? I go into a an inpatient at the ACT, okay. Ogden, Ogden Regional Hospital. At the time, Rick Vesser, who was there, who actually uh, left there and did the action recovery that I'm in now, uh huh. Um, he was my first counselor when I was in my 20s. But again, I was I was there for not me. 
And so how many days did you do there? Uh, 30. And then the aftercare program started, and that was supposed to be two years, and I lasted like maybe three months because he pissed me off because he said I couldn't go. I had something planned, and he's like, it's either here or there. And I'm like, well, screw you, and I left. Yeah, those addiction therapists are tough, <laughs> tough cookies, man. Trying to hold you accountable. <laughs> right. right. What right do they no, have? But yeah. They are. I think I, if you – here's a little peek behind the curtain. Like there's lots of different kinds of therapists, lots of different kinds of therapy. And I will say you kind of have to have that tough nut personality to be a really good addictions therapist because they'll look you in the face and just go, well, it's it's us or them, buddy. You make the choice. And I'll tell you why. And I know why. Yeah. It's because – they have spent a career of being lied to and tried to be manipulated by every guy who thinks he's different. Right. You don't understand. Which is every guy. Is every guy. <laughs> but, that, but that's what it is. And he goes, no, these yeah. are the rules. You either do them or you don't do them. I'm not going to get in an argument. I'm not going to have you try to persuade me. That's not what we're about. Do you want your sobriety or not? Because yep. this is the way it is. And it puts a person in a position of choosing. And sometimes you have to make the wrong choice for a while until you know – you want to make the right choice. So you stay sober this time for how long? I I don't think it was very long. It may have been a few months that I can think of. And this is quite a while ago. Mm-hmm. And I don't even remember how I started back up again. Um, probably taking someone's medication or having it offered to me at work or something like that. And then it just, again, that craving was on. And you said that going into that first rehab – you felt you didn't say this, so I don't want to put. But you felt pressured by by your circumstances, your your spouse. Like what? What was the reason you really went in that first time? Because I didn't. I I felt like even though I I did reach out and ask, I'm like I need some help. But it was I was in that moment of withdrawal and and feeling really really bad that I that I talked to her. Mm-hmm. And I remember that night because I I had drank because I was I was trying to reach for something. You know, something to feel a little bit better. Something to scratch the itch. Something to scratch the itch. And, and that's when uh, I, I told her what I was doing, taking medication. And so and she's like, yeah, point, you need she help. she didn't know? At that point, she was – I mean, she knew, but she didn't know the extent. Right? That's usually the case, right? She knew because they know. Even your kids know. That's the thing. Even little kids. You think they, they don't know. know they know. Wrong. Yeah. Something's yeah. wrong with dad. We just don't know. But and then they get older. So you went – But so, so you asked for help and then she's like, yeah, I get help. And then – I'm assuming you were kind of like, well, not that much help. Right, exactly. <laughs> I like, I don't, I don't need that much. <laughs> Why are you packing a bag? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm not I just going need anywhere. A little bit of help. <laughs> In fact, that was the conversation. Right. The next day, she's like, let's, let's, I'm like, no, I'm good. Yeah. And then she got so pissed at me that I'm like, okay, I'll go. But sometimes, I mean, in my act of addiction, you will say things just to get out of the conversation. You know what I mean? You'll or, agree to a lot, or, or, right? Yeah, or to manipulate the situation. You yeah. know what I mean? If I say this, maybe you won't be so mad about this. You know what I mean? And that's where the manipulation becomes uh, just an art form. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And then sometimes they call you on it and you're like, oh, oh. man. <laughs> I wasn't serious. About that. I, I was a little <laughs> drunk and, and withdrawn, but it looks like I'm going to rehab. But I think that's a good example. <laughs> of how it changes day to day, even moment to moment, where in one of those desperate moments where you're feeling like I'm at a low, I, I really need some help, you reach out and then you even out a little bit, start to feel a little better and you're like, oh, no, no, I'm good. Right. You know, I'm good. Right. And that creates that cycle. Yeah. We're going to take a break here. Then when we come back, we're going to find out how the uh, road to addiction continues for Robert. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Our guest today is Robert Woolsey. We're talking about the first time he went into rehab, which was at the age of 26. He's currently 52. How many times did you go to He's rehab? He's not 52 yet. He's got a couple of good weeks left. You're knocking on the door. If <laughs> I'm knocking on the door. It's coming up in May. So, yeah, it's not. It's around the corner. A lot. You went to a lot? A lot. So, so at one point, it was Relapse Rob. <laughs> that's what, that's what that, that, that's what I was known for. Relapse Rob, like on the street, uh, like, just like in the groups and the meetings. They're like, "Hey, you're back! Oh, he's gone! Oh, he's back! Oh, he's gone! It's relapse he's back. Rob. He's gone." So, because I mean, I get, thank God for that revolving door. And and the cool thing about recovery, this is what's really cool because you know every time I went in and, and did any kind of um, like even going in and detox and and doing some meetings, I um, I would see people that were basically had the same time frame. You know, and, and all mm. these years going back, I see these people. I'm like, and, 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 you know, you have that thought, like, if I would have stayed sober, I would have the time you have. 
you right, know? Right, 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 yeah. And that, that, that gave me hope, though. You know, it gave me hope that Coming those people- Coming back into contact with those people over and over, over again. Over and over. I'm yeah. like, God, you're just doing good. That's awesome. And, and I will say this about the recovery community, uh, even if your nickname is Relapse Rob. <laughs> uh, you know, how many times you people come back? They're always welcoming. They always welcome. And, 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 your, and, and your only criteria is the, your want to be sober. Desire, yeah. The yeah. desire. Yeah. That's, a, it, that's a beautiful thing because there aren't too many places in life like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, fool me once, fool me, you know, but yeah. Yeah, this time it's like, hey, look, no, this time maybe it'll work. And, and they're optimist and, they're, and, and everything's cool. Yeah. So you've done it a lot. So um, where does your story take a turn for the, the – For the worse. Yeah. So about six years ago – the divorce happened because she had enough. Finally, she had enough, she and I can't blame her. Time. Can't blame her. There was, there was, you know, the cheating was happening. Not on my part, but I knew it was happening, and and that made me just want to drink more, you know. But it's like, do I blame her? I am been sleeping with my addiction for all these years. You've been married to. Your I've addiction. been married to it, you know, and and so I can't, I cannot blame her for that. Um, I, it, it was hard. It was hard because she always said, it, you're, you're choosing that over your family. You know, she and, – and, and, and to this day, she – I don't think she truly believes that it's a disease. It's mm. a choice. And that was hard for me because she didn't want to do the Al-Anon. And that's OK because not everybody wants to do Al-Anon. That, that's – again, that's not for everyone, right? It's not, but I'll put a plug in. I think that really helps heal the family system because – you're absolutely right. You're recognizing that you your addiction hurt her. Yeah. And I hope she'll find something that helps her heal. Right. But I do think Al Anon's a great place to start. Yeah. Absolutely. I I 100% because I've seen the couples that do it. And and yeah, there's a difference, isn't there? Huge difference. And even if they divorce, there's a difference in their how they get along and you know, cuz you always have a relationship even if you get divorced because you have kids, there'll always be something you share, and it's it's nice to eventually get to a point where it can be enjoyable. You be in the same room, yeah, be in the same room, and even even ha- you know enjoy with the, the at least what you share in life, which are your kids. But I think you bring up a wonderful point, and that is that if you, sometimes people will say like, "Well, how do you have a happy marriage?" I'll, you know, ask me those kind of like really broad questions, and I I'm the kind of guy who loves. The idea of things being sort of magical. I, I wish I was a Jedi, like, you know, all that kind of stuff since I was a kid. But the reality is the answer is work. Like, if you want to have a healthy, uh, you know, marital, committed, intimate relationship that lasts 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, if you want to be that couple that's happy, you've worked for it. So anything that divides your attention from each other, anything that takes you away from each other in your marriage has the potential to really damage the relationship. And, you know, workaholics, that's that takes you away from each other. Um, having extramarital relationships, whether they're sexual or not, takes you away from each other. And substance abuse is a huge one. Takes you. You may be in the same room of the same house, but you're not together. I once met this old guy who'd been married for 50 years, and I said, hey, what's your secret to success? And he said, I said, yes, a lot. <laughs> so well, you're telling me this guy lied. <laughs> well, that might have been work for him to have to say yes. I don't know. Um, you know there's a certain amount of giving in. I, I'm not going to say there isn't. But but two people that are saying yes to each other a lot, mm-hmm. that's that's that can end up as a pretty good marriage. So you end up getting divorced, mm-hmm. uh, and do you do what most people do after the divorce? Go on a terror? I did. I did. Well, here's the crazy thing. So she she dropped me off at the ACT. Mm-hmm. Like, um, so she dropped me off at the ACT, and I went through um, I went through rehab again. And as I was going through that, she went her way. Within six months, I had someone moving in to, to my house. It, that that part was hard, and I stayed sober through it. But about a year, maybe just short of a year and a half, I just couldn't – my recovery just wasn't strong enough. I, I didn't have that, that, that prayer, you know, that meditation, that connection wasn't there. So I was, I was just on shaky ground, you know. Recovery you feel, has to be number did, one, Did period. you feel like you'd been replaced? Yeah. Oh, when yeah. Somebody moves into the house that was your house. Yep. And, and my daughter was freaking out. It was just a bad situation yeah. and I just let it get to me and, and that took me to the – 
two that's two a bad si- a day. That's a bad situation, even if substance and alcohol is not involved. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's I found out my handle. ex-wife was engaged while I was in rehab, and everybody was trying to figure out if that was the best place. And my therapist goes, this is probably the best place for him to find out. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. he'll be able to process this information. Contain his freak out. I mean, I'm yeah. just to be honest with you. I mean, I'm, I've always been honest with you, but I was like, yeah. I mean, probably, because had I been left to my own... It might uh, not have been good. Yeah, it might not have ended well. Yeah. But it sounds like a year after, uh, it just popped. It unraveled. So, um, and, and that, again, that was six years ago, and I just was, I've been kind of on a on a tear. You know, it's been a roller coaster. But, you know, it towards the end, um, towards the end, I I had my, I have the, my, my twins, and, and the, the oldest one by four minutes, we butt heads. He's stubborn, and we butt heads uh, a lot, especially through high school. I mean, we – it was sometimes pretty bad, right? Um, he came over. He, he was always checking on me, you know, and, and I always reeked of alcohol. And he's like, Dad, what are you doing? You know, and I'm like, just mind your own business. This is my problem, not yours. Go away, mm-hmm. you know? And then the last time he he talked to me, he's like, Dad, I just want you to know that – you realize that if you continue this way, you lose and mom wins. That's all he had to say. That's all he had to say that just was like a light switch to me. Hmm. You lose and mom wins because she, she left you because of this. And, 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 and everything that she's done is justified because you're doing what you're still doing. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Boy, that's for my boy? Okay, yeah. I got I to gotta do something here. And that's – that's where I'm at right here. My right dad now. told me something similar to that when I was in the midst of mine. Uh, and everybody was saying that I was an alcoholic and I was a drunk and all these things. And he goes, son, you got two choices here. You can either prove them wrong or you can prove them right. Yeah. And yeah. right now you're proving them right. Yeah. And – but I didn't listen. <laughs> I mean I should have. I mean I really should have. Yeah. You know? Well, um, and, well it, that, there's an individual difference in that. You know, sometimes – we're ready to, to hear something that helps us change our mind. And then somebody says something as simple as your son said to you, and it flips that switch and you see everything differently. And for you, that switch didn't get flipped at that moment. Mm-mm. But now you look back and you realize dad had really good advice. Yeah. So after your son says that, what do you do? Um, I still drink, of course. And that lasted for probably maybe almost a year. Any run-ins with the law or driving or any of that? I don't know how I dodged that bullet, but I dodged it so many times. Like literally been pulled over with my boys in the back when they were little mm-hmm. after going up riding, dirt bike riding and coming home. And uh, the cop, I did the walk the line and passed. And then I did the breathalyzer and I'm like, I'm, this is it. I'm done. And it didn't work. And then he called another cop, and the cop came, and his didn't work. Whoa. So (laughs) here's these moments in my life when I'm taken off and nothing happened. I'm like, is that – is it time? You know how you have these moments in life where you're like, that's a sign. It's time. You got a little freebie, a little redo opportunity. It's a time to change. Yeah, but the way the addict brain works is – it will twist that story to tell you you were fine. Yeah. Look, what yeah. Ha- nothing yeah, happened. Nothing if happened. you were really that drunk, you would have been yep. handcuffed and your kids would have been taken off. So you find ways to manipulate the truth. Justify To it. justify it and, and oh, bend man. it to your vision. It's it's insane. It really yep. is crazy. So you keep yeah. continue drinking. Yep. I keep continue drinking. Um, and it, it, there was a point that I didn't have a job. And that's when my drinking really got bad. Which really is crazy. Got bad. Because, uh, I mean, you shouldn't have the money or the time. Or you have uh, the right. time, but you shouldn't have the money. I, yeah, yeah, I was spending, of course, I was spending money I, I didn't have. But, um, and then it, about two about two years ago is when I found out that the Blairs, who I worked for for several years, sold the Leighton Cycle and Newgate Motorsports to the Youngs. Mm hmm. So I had called my buddy Jeremy, who I hired, and said, "Hey, and and because they wanted me back, I just at, I, at that time I was the divorce and I needed benefits. Mm-hmm. So I went back. I cleaned up quickly. This is another story of mine. I I can clean up real quick and accelerate and make money and do really well in life, but it's that recovery part that I'm not putting first. 
And that's what happened. So two years, I go from just selling to the GM at the Layton store, and here I am. You said in the elevator on the way up, I said, what's your DOC? For you guys who don't know, that's a drug of choice. You said vodka. I said, how much were you drinking? You said two-fifths a day. I got to two-fifths a day, and it was – That's that's, a, that's incredible. I mean, me. you want to talk about not having a job. That's a full-time job. Oh. I mean, drinking two-fifths a day is a full-time yeah. job. From the time I got up to the time I went to bed, and it was miserable. It was absolutely miserable. It really was. Like – there's nothing more miserable than that. When somebody says they're drinking that volume, my heart breaks because I know that is an unhappy, sad, depressed, miserable existence. And you'll have right? like people when you hear like sometimes when we talk about like how much can a person drink, it's sort of in that like, you know, who's the toughest guy in the room party sort of mentality. But when a person is drinking that much alcohol every day. Man, it's just a heartbreak, isn't it? Because there's no party there. No, it, there's no party. The party's gone long ago. The 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 euphoric. The, the maintenance is all it is. I'm maintaining so I don't get absolutely horrifically sick, right? And, and the crazy thing, rewind when it was high school, when it was drinking with friends, I outdrank the big football players. Like that was my thing. I can outdrink you, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm just a little guy, and I would outdrink them, and they'd be puking. I'm like, see, told you. <laughs> so my my again my alcoholism started way back then. Right, that mentality could, that's an alcoholic mm-hmm, mentality, right? Yeah, you like know. look at yeah. Even if you weren't dependent every day on it, the 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 thought process had yeah, started. All of that it all started way back then for sure. But drinking two fists a day can only go on for so long. Something's got to give. That could kill you. Right? Yeah, and that's and so and the crazy thing is, is is again I've been in these rooms you know listening to stories and blackouts and people that. You know, every time they drink, they black out and end up in a different state or all this. I'm like, yeah, I don't get that blackout thing. And so as at the end, I'm like, I wonder what that feels like. This is the crazy mindset. Like, I wonder what that feels like. I'm going to drink until I black out. And uh, and I never did. I never blacked out. I would just drink, you know, to the point of just falling on my bed and falling asleep. But I wake up and I could remember. But I remember at the yeah. end – like I went to grab my phone and it just fell out of my hands. You know, I my like I was shaky and my I, my I just was not right at all. Well, it's interesting. Everybody's body is different. We process food and metabolize. Yeah, yeah. metabolize alcohol differently. And some people do have that blackout experience where you know it's horrific for them to to not be able to remember the whole night before and what they did. Um, in your case, that wasn't your case, but it's interesting that. You had the mentality of, like, I want to. Basically, you were saying, I want to see what it's like to get that sick, right? Right, like, yeah. like, like I want to see what it's like to black out, and that is an addict brain at work, right? For sure, yeah, for sure. So, how does that end then? I mean, how do you go from two fifths a day to passing out on your bed to now being twenty eight days sober? There had to be something in there that happened. That got you to go. This is it. So, um, so, so the the, the two fifths a day that I cleaned up, and then I got my job, and I stayed sober for maybe two months, right? But that again, it sells. Uh, it, there's a lot of people in amongst the young group that drink. Like we're always drinking, right? In Cancun, we're drinking. I mean, there's lots of perks, and so I started drinking again. But I I was able to I guess call it managing it. I mean it, I could I could feel myself getting to that point again, right? So I didn't get to the two fifths a day, but I was drinking at at a minimal at least a pint if not more on my day off. If I wasn't working the next day, oh, it was on. I was drinking as much. So you managed for a little while, but yeah. you, I like it, that how it, you describe that. You could feel it coming on, and that's when I went to my, you know, the the guy that's running all the stores now that I. No, as a friend from a, you know from back when when the Blair days. So so you work for Young Motorsports, mm-hmm. and for people who don't know, what do they sell? Uh, we sell Blair, pretty much all brands now because they keep buying up stores. So there's there's Polaris, Honda, Kawasaki, Yamaha, Suzuki, all Can-Am, those fun toys, all the toys yeah. which I absolutely enjoy. And so it's I a fun it. atmosphere. What was it like going to your boss? And saying you needed some help, like how hard was that? It was difficult. It was difficult because I, I, I had, and that's why I think it took me so long. 
you know, because my boys would even say, "What, you know, Dad, we are, what are you doing again? What are you doing? You yeah. know? And um, I'm like, I, I, it just took a long time for me to get that. Courage? That courage, yeah. And I finally got the courage and I went to him. And, and you know, I, I here's what I didn't do back when with the old owner when I when I felt like I needed help. I didn't go to him, which I, I know he probably would have been like, yeah, go. We, we'll, we're behind you. Um, and it, it's again, it's a blessing because he's like, I want Rob. I don't, you know, I because I, they can tell. Uh, they, there's just no way around it. They right. there's they know that there's I'm not right. You know, even though I wasn't drinking and going to work, I could only make it to to the end of the day, and and I was just still. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt myself slipping. You're that. white knuckling it till. Oh then. my gosh! Like it's like I need to get out of here. I need to go get my drink because I'm starting to feel this. Were you worried about your boss's potential reaction? Like, did you worry uh, he's not going to be that understanding? He's not going to be helpful, or or did you? What was that like trying to talk yourself into going? You know, I felt I felt like um, I felt like he was going to understand. You know, because because he's known of people that's that's had you know, mm-hmm. at, whether it's an addiction to cocaine or whatever. And so when I went to him, he just he was he was happy for me. He's like, "Look, I good for you." Good. And what 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 was hard though? What was hard is saying leaving my team, right, my sales team, because I'm running the store, and saying I'm. I'm basically giving up my position and I'll see you when I see you. Right. You know? Well, I think that's, I mean, the reason I'm asking about this part of it is because this is a roadblock to a lot of people's recovery. They're they're legitimately, understandably so worried about what's going to happen to my job. You know, even, even companies that promote resources to help people with addiction, they say, you know, we have, we have these resources. We want you to ask for them. I know that the individual person it often is like, I don't know. Yeah, but because when I was working for the recovery center and doing this podcast, people say that all the time. But what about my job? And my response back is, you keep going like you're going. There's not going to be a job it anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and so then that's true. but that's not how you think in the no, moment. No, no, no. But that's but that's how I finally just break my eye. Go. Let me ask you this: Say you don't do anything. Where do you think your job is going to be in it? Three months, six months to a yeah. year. Yeah, you're going to lose you're, it. You're going to lose it anyway. At least this way, you've got a fighting chance to keep it. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm with you and I'm with Rob. Like Rob made the right choice and I encourage people to do that. But I also at the same time understand how scary that is on a few different levels. One is, of course, potentially losing the job. The other is sort of being relegated to the sidelines. Once you get sober, maybe they kind well, of don't my, take you seriously That's why I never did. I mean, anymore. I'm telling you this is what you should do, but it's not what I did. I mean, I tried to fix it myself, and we all know how that ended up. Well, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> right. I mean, just to be honest with you, yeah. I mean, I, hindsight, once again, if I could go back, I'd be like, yeah, hey, I'm sorry. I've got this yeah. problem, and I want to address it and get it fixed. But, but I in didn't. those moments, it's scary. Oh, 100%. And reputation, that's another thing. Oh, yeah. People are like, hey, I don't want everybody to know. But like Rob said, everybody they knows. Know. Yeah. They know. They know. And, but, and the, but you don't know that they know. But yep. yeah. And that actually felt it felt really good because not only did I tell him, but I, I basically went to my team – you know, and it, it just felt really good to not have anything, you know. Yeah. And this, this is what I'm doing because I need this for me because my health is more important than my job and money and all that other stuff because it'll all come. I believe in that. I believe all that's still going to be there. I think so, too. It, it will because I know I can do and, all that. And that's a beautiful self-confidence that you yeah. just described. And I think it's necessary. Yeah. So you tell them you're going to go take some time and figure yourself out. Where do you go? Go to action. I go to action recovery. So I did the research and I don't know why I picked action. I had no idea it was uh, Rick who started this from the ACT, you know, yeah. but it just, it seemed like they had more, just more concrete. They had more uh, resources, you know, they had therapists and they had all kinds of different therapy. And I just liked, I just like what I read kind of like a, like, you know, well, it's like buying shoes or yeah. buying a, a, right. a, a Polaris, whatever it is. Right. You got to find the, the features one that's and g- benefits. Yeah, what's going to fit your needs the best? Yes, and they did, and I went, and uh, it's been awesome. It really has. And I you, mean, you got to have a second chance with Rick, the tough therapist. 
you know what the crazy thing is? I was I was excited to meet him, but he literally had just left. Oh, he retired. Okay. Oh, he did. So oh. I'm waiting for him to show up. He hasn't showed up yet, just to to see if he even recognizes me because I'm the the guy that you know what? was pissed off and left his class. I bet you he'll he'll absolutely remember you. Those guys have a have a long That's memory. True. Yeah, yeah. So, 28 days sober. What does every day look like for you when you wake up? Man, so I I. Exercise is a big part of my recovery, and so I even tried that back in the day. I got into CrossFit and stayed sober for a lo- for for a time frame because that was my new high. But again, recovery is recovery, and you got to have it, or you're not going to stay sober. Mm-hmm. You got to have that connection with that higher power, or you're not going to stay sober. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that all these all these years. But you were just trying to fill the hole. Oh uh, yeah, I was just trying to fill the hole. Um, but I I. I believe in meditation. I believe in all my readings. I read a lot of a lot of spiritual stuff, a lot of uh, motivational kind of stuff in the morning. So I have like that time in the morning, and then I'll do the gym, and then I go to my 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 classes. Um, I'm just getting ready to transition out and back to the, to life. So now I'll be going back to work on Monday. And will you continue to have like an IOP or? Some sort of like aftercare. Aftercare. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have the aftercare for a year, and then I know I know where I've gone wrong in the past. And again, I've I've gotten well. And even my first sponsor told me this because he's seen the, this pattern. He's like, Rob, you get doing well, you, you get feeling better, doing well, making money, and then recovery goes here, and and recovery is priority. You got to put it first because if you put anything above it, that's what you're going to lose. It's going to fail again, and a hundred percent, hundred percent guaranteed failure if you don't put it first. So, what would you say to somebody out there that's in the early stages of recovery? What advice could you give them? You know, I the, the advice I would give them is never give up, never give up, because I know in the deep depths of our addiction recovery, we want to give up. You know, I've told my boys time and time again, I'm not ever going to give up, guys. So I will fight this to the death, right? Um, to never give up. Um, and when it comes right down to it, that connection, you got to have it. You got to have it. If you don't believe in God, if you don't, I mean, you got to have something that moves you. Yeah. It, whatever that may be. You know, and I think my block there was because I, you know, I grew up the prominent religion here. I went on, a, you know, and I think there's that there was that block because I felt like I had to be perfect. As as I got married and had a young family, I thought I had to be perfect in order to receive to, to just the spiritual to, yeah, to, to have God in my life. Yeah, and that that's just not true. Well, and that's a huge. I talk to people about that all the time. Where. If you have a perfection-based mentality, you're going to lose. You're always going to fail. Perfection, first of all, when anybody comes in and talks to me, you know that I like to say perfection isn't a thing. Perfection is a stupid goal. Perfection is it's not impossible. something that exists. It's progress, not perfection. That's yes, it. right. And so because as soon as you set a, a goal of perfection, you've set up yourself to fail yep. because nothing is perfect. And to be successful, it doesn't need to be. Right. You don't need perfection. But perfection is this lie we tell ourselves, like, if I'm perfect, then I don't have any worries. And it's like, but then it's, yeah. So it's, I love the fact that you've modeled that because as soon as you let go of that perfection mentality, the world opens up to you mm-hmm. and you can invite, you can accept yourself for who you are and invite spirituality into your life. And having that inspiration that comes from your personal spiritual connection, whatever it may be, is one of the most motivating things for people. I mean, I, I rarely, if ever, meet somebody who's just crushing it on all six cylinders in life who doesn't have some sort of spiritual connection without that drive to be perfect. And I, yeah. I think that's that's great. Yeah, I, I really, yeah. So so my whole, because I, I believe that alcoholism and addiction is is a, a disease of the of the body, mind, and soul when you're broken, spiritually broken, physically broken, mentally just broken, right? And you have to have like an equilibrium. So I feel like uh, um, being, you know, eating healthy, it's going to obviously help. Um, having that spiritual connection and then just, you know, feed my mind full of good stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Because our, my mind is a I bad, like how it's you like said a, 
It's like a bad neighborhood. You know what I mean? <laughs> like up there is like a bad neighborhood sometimes. You just I like how stay you said you it. wake up every morning and not just do the, the, I mean, I believe in meditation and, and all those things, but you read mm-hmm. something inspiring in the morning and that, that sets a mentality for the day. That's a great habit. Yeah. Well, what you're talking about is mind, body, and soul. Yeah. And uh, I think those are great pillars for anyone and their recovery. I want to say I am so grateful for you to coming down today and sharing your story. I mean, 28 days. I mean, that is that is amazing. That is raw and that is beautiful. Uh, Dr. Matt, any last words? Uh, same. Ditto. Thank you for coming. I'm super excited to have you on the show today. I think people are really going to connect with your story. And I want to get I'm going to pressure you a little bit right now. Can we get you back in in a in a few months? Absolutely. and have a check in and see how you're doing. Because yeah. I would love that. I would like to change your yeah. name from Relapse Rob to Recovery Rob. There are you, hey, Recovery hey. Rob. Yeah. You know what I mean? hey. hey, look, man, there's Recovery hey, Rob. Hey, I like that. That's a much better sound. Yeah. There you go. Hey, thank you for stopping by and listening to the podcast today. It is brought to you by our friends at KnowYourScript.org. Go check them out. Uh, you'll find a lot of great information there. And in case you forgot, Project Recovery is what. It's a KSL podcast. Recovery Rob. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.